Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 215 for Monday, June 17th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. At least I think that's where I am. I'm Dave Hamilton. You're in Los Gatos, California. It's Paul Kent. And there you are. This is such a good thing. We've I, I love I, I love that when we have technical difficulties, no one has to experience them. But when you have them five times in a row, it feels like you better acknowledge it right here in the show, because otherwise <laughs> we're going to have them a sixth time. So there you go. You're kind of telegraphing a, uh, uh, you know, a, a boner there. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, definitely. For sure. Yeah. 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 This feels like the Teen Town edition because it's 215, June 17, 2019. That's one of my favorite uh, Jaco Pastorius songs that uh, that became a, a weather report hit. Uh, one of the hardest songs to, to play, at least for a bass player and a keyboard player, because there's that whole, um, you know what song I'm talking about? Have you heard this song at all? No. Paul? So it's nope. this, it, there's this, um, I guess you'd call it a melody line. It's this syncopated uh, melody that Jocko wrote uh, and he plays it on the bass. He actually played drums on that tune too, for anybody that, that, uh, that cares about those sorts of things. Cause Jocko actually was a great drummer, but it's got this, uh, this really fast syncopated, and so he plays that on the bass and Zavano played it along with him on the keys and so it was this i mean it was amazing you, you know you go go find a video I'll, I'll i'll find a video of them playing teen town but uh did, did um jocko write most of weather report stuff no i think zavanol and shorter wrote most of them and then there were tunes that jocko had like teen town that he brought in but you know jocko was playing teen town separate from weather report too he played it with all those like when he was playing with kenwood denard and and uh oh crap why can't i remember this guitar player stanley jordan maybe no uh maybe no i don't know i don't know who it was but uh but anyway he yeah 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 so he had some tunes and that was that was one of them but uh monster player man i got to see jocko you know with weather report it was the first mm -hmm. concert i ever saw i wish i was older but you know, that's not. Do you remember if there was an opening band? I do not believe there was, but there might have been. I mean, I was, I saw him at the Beacon Theater in 1980. So I was nine years old, 10 years old, maybe. So yeah, I was, I was, I was young. I don't remember an opening band, but I, 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 um, they might have played two shows every night. Um, uh, it, you know, so that so it might have been, you know, fill the house, play the show, clear the house, fill the house kind of thing, mm. which is if you by the way, folks, if you can do that, that's a great <laughs> way. We did that a couple of nights on tour with the Clambake and man, it, gosh, it was like it was great because, you know, you play the same set twice in a row. No problem. So and get paid two times. Load gear one time. So, one time. Load gear one time. Yeah, man. So. <laughs> So anyway, there you go. That's uh, I I don't know what any of that meant, but there you go. Fun it's, little story. It's Teen so, Town. It's Teen Town, man. Yeah, it's, it is. It is. It's a it's a crazy frenetic place to be. You just sometimes you just got to go with it. Yeah. If you got teens, you know that. I uh, that is true. I live in Teen Town these days too, as well with my <laughs> daughter home from school. So yeah, there you go. There you go. How was you your play weekend, last man? weekend? I, yes. Well, mine was. Mine was great. I did play. We um we had well I had uh actually I had a monkey fist gig for Thursday night that got rained out, which was kind of a shame, uh you know because th those are always fun gigs. But um but you know it was nice to have a, a kind of bonus night home with the family. So that's never it's like it's always a double edged sword when a gig gets rained out. But um and then Saturday had a uh, had a fling gig at a new club for us. This place called the Stadium in Portsmouth, which is. Great. Downtown Portsmouth is often a disaster with parking and and all of that because it's just a downtown area and there's no great um, opportunities for that. But where this club is, they've actually got their own lot that people can park in. And we were able to like load in was easy. Load out was easy. It was 
it was actually great. And the, and the club was nice. They've got a stage in there and uh sound Big stage. Yeah. Yeah. It's this tiered uh, stage it's got two tiers. So, um, you know, almost like a, you know, maybe a six inch tier, eight inch tier kind of thing. So it's almost like having a, a drum riser sort of platform across the back. So keys, drums, and bass went up back. We put the two guitars down in front. We played in the two, three position, which was really nice because everybody had a nice view and, um, and it worked out really well. Yeah. Nice, nice setup. Uh, band played, we played well. I, you know, fling, um, fling does best on multi-set gigs. I have, I have, come to realize you know we've, we occasionally will do these like one setters or whatever you know when we do our our fling fests we generally only play one set because we you know we'll have we'll have some guests with us or whatever that will play in an opening set and it's fine but but when we can settle in uh we that's really where fling shines the best and 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 shine we did we had a really we had a really good night um musically the crowd was good um uh, club was happy you know so it was like positive all the way around at least by the end of the gig it was positive all the way around the setup was a little weird and i actually posted a thing when i on our facebook page uh at uh giggabpodcast.com slash facebook when i got home about setup and routine and because we did a different kind of setup for this one that that made the beginning of the gig very mm, interesting for me but you know that's how it goes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So go back to that thing about multiple sets is when fling shines. What what is it about multiple set gigs that makes flings shine? I think we're able to kind of get warmed up and relaxed into it. Maybe you know um, we don't feel like we have to play the whole arc of the set all at once. Maybe is what it is. I, I I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't quite dissected it enough to know why. But it is it it it's obvious that it is true to me, you know. Um, oh, but do you think it's a it's a Pavlovian learned behavior thing? Because yeah, oh, definitely, uh, yeah, my, yeah. For my, yeah, for my band, we if it's a two hour gig or less, we go straight through. If it's a two hour gig or more, we'll take a you know. We ne- I don't think we ever do four hour gigs anymore. But um, sure three hour gigs, it'll be, it'll be two sets. And it, it get, and my band used to hate me for the two hour gigs straight through. Um, and I will occasionally, or if the, if the gig requires it, you know, we'll take a, a, a break, you know, in sure. the middle somewhere, but I would prefer not. And I, my arc is the two hour arc. Right. Yeah. And you know, it depends on a lot of things, it depends on where we're playing, you know, what I know about how fast, the the group is ready to party from downbeat on uh you know and i would say mostly those first three or four songs are the hardest to um put in a set you know because especially you know different situations i like to go out hard and go you know pedal the metal from the beginning that's just the what i like that's what i want the vibe of my band to be even if there's only a few people Around when we start, I you know want that kind of hardworking reputation, right? Yeah, you, well, you got to deliver, right? You got to come come out of the gate. I always say that it's an exchange of energy between band and crowd, and it's awesome when the crowd starts it. But you have to not expect that. You have to be the prepared to be the one to hit the stage and be the first to sort of deliver the first volley of energy, and and then and then you can get it back. Yeah. Well, sort of, sort of. So, so I agree with you mostly, but there are those places that benefit from three or four mid tempo to slightly up tempo songs just to get the room warmed up. To warm sometimes. the room up. Sure. That's that, totally true. If it's a dinner crowd or whatever, absolutely. You got to think about that too. Yep. Yep. Right. And yep. so, I, you know, like we have sometimes. gigs where, yeah. yes. So if, you know, if we're the last band at the end of a day of bands um you know people have been around and there's been music going you don't need that right you you know the the crowd is by definition warmed up warmed up right there's also you know gigs where like we had a honestly might be one of the best gigs house rockers ever did on friday night and it was the opening of one of the better outdoor music series in the in the area like great crowd amazing community involvement and they this was the first one and there was all this pent up ready to get summer kicked off energy it's it, no matter when you play this series over the 12 weeks that they do it yeah. it's great um and i didn't know if the first one would be great because you know yeah, people aren't the first quite one. into their summer routines sure. you know the, the parents aren't home from work you know they haven't really eased into that but this was right from downbeat 
it was time to celebrate summer and it was it was really it, like I said could be even Simon who's a pretty hard grader said he doesn't give a lot of A's but it was an A and um, that's great it, yeah it was a great one and but uh, my point to all this was uh, I had to train my band that a two hour gig is the normal right a two hour sure. set is the normal a- absolutely yeah that makes sense and I I. It, in terms of your timing thing, if we're playing, if we're slotted to play for two hours or less, that's one set, even with fling, like because it's the only way you're going to there's no I, again, in, unless unless there's some extenuating circumstance. But but you want to keep that energy going. Two hours isn't isn't long enough to play two sets, in my opinion. I think you just play it straight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so but tell fling, me again about your. Your uh, your your setup was different. I think you were telling me before we got on the air that you set up like particularly early in the in the day that day. Yeah, because it was an I think I I'm not exactly sure the genesis of how this happened. It was but it was just clear to me, you know, come Friday, that there was a lot of momentum moving towards getting set up early in the day and then going back there, at, you know, at night for an eight o'clock downbeat, you know, get there, whatever, seven, seven thirty, go play. And uh, and, you know, it's a new club. It's for us. And it actually is a new club. Um, and, you know, we we weren't sure about the load in and how that was going to work and everything. And so it's like, OK, fine, whatever. Uh, you know, we'll go down and we'll do it. We'll bang it out in an hour or whatever. And uh, it took us longer to get set up than uh, than any of us anticipated. And, and that was just sort of a comedy of errors. But that that's fine. It, it, that wouldn't <laughs> that wouldn't have. But but. That would not have happened had we got there at 630, right? Because deadlines are wonderful motivators, right? If you know you've got an eight o'clock downbeat. Downbeat is downbeat. Downbeat is downbeat, right? And and it's interesting. You know, I have gotten in the habit with fling. I I stole something from my or borrowed something from my theater uh, experience. When you're backstage before a show, even if it's not the first show, even if it's the 20th show, You've got somebody coming around every five minutes telling you, you know, okay, you know, 20 minutes to curtain, 15 minutes to or 20 minutes to places, 15 minutes to places, whatever, and counting you down. So you've got it going in your head. And then uh, most of the time, you know, you get to five minutes and then the next thing you hear is we're holding because there's some line out the door, or what, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, and so I started doing that with fling like, okay, hour to downbeat. 45 minutes to downbeat, 30 minutes to downbeat, you know, 15, 10, five, that kind of thing, just to, to keep us on track. I was not. Do you do this verbally to guys because yes. you're all in place or you send a text message to guys because my guys kind of scatter to the wind before a gig. Right. Well, so most of the time, our the fling routine, and I think th- there is no right way to do this, but there is your band's way. Right. And whatever your band has learned is is what your band has learned. So with fling. Most of the time, the gigs we play, we will get there, set up and play, you know, rarely with fling with like monkey fist. We have a different routine. We get there, we set up, then we have dinner together and then we play, Hmm. you know, but we're usually playing these acoustic gigs at places that that are like, you know, dinner places and they start early and, you know, whatever. So uh, but with fling, generally, the routine is show up at the club, you know, 90 minutes, maybe maybe an hour before downbeat. We set up and we play. We're a very efficient band. We've we've sorted out the division of labor. Usually, we're a very efficient band. We've sorted and out. Are you, do you do you load in while the club's open? Because like yeah. our Charlie's gigs, yeah, we load in yeah. and we're we're done with setup and sound check. And I'll talk about sound check in a little bit. Sure, but uh, we are done by six forty five with sound check for seven o'clock. Doors open. Got it. And yeah. then we play at seven thirty. Right. So when Do we're you playing, load in while the club is open. Absolutely. Because most of the clubs that we play are open from like, you know, 11 in the morning onward or whatever. Got so, it. Yep. Got it, got it, got it. yeah. So we just we get there, whatever, 90 minutes before we load our crap and we, you know, if we park our cars, if we can't leave them right where they, you know, where we would want to kind of thing. And then and then we set up and I'm counting this down. And of course, I didn't do that on on Saturday because there was no counting down. I mean, it was like, all right, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's nine hours to downbeat like that. <laughs> well, that would have seemed excessive, you know, and, but in retrospect or, or effective or effective, correct. In, <laughs> in retrospect, I, I should not have let the, the system change because the, this, the, us, us doing something atypical for ourselves 
was, you know, sort of caused a few of these errors in the comedy. But it, it, it was fine. Like we got set up, but, you know, our keyboard player couldn't make it because he lives a little further away now. So he didn't want to do the, the round trip to, you know, twice. Which is totally understandable. So we couldn't really set we couldn't really sound check the way we would or we couldn't even do line checks the way we would want to. There was a big screen there. They do have a ded- dedicated stage, but there was a big screen down, uh, you know, during the day. They they project sports or you know whatever they want, generally sports on the screen, mm-hmm. which is fine. But that screen sat basically right in the middle of where my drum stool was. So I couldn't really like, you know, get my kit warmed up or you know set exactly right and so i spent most of the first set uh, later that night sort of dealing with that and we didn't really get line checks the way we wanted to it because setup took so long it was just like let's get out of here and uh and then i also left my car at the gig intentionally uh because i figured well you know why bring these cars all home and then come back and russ and i live not too far from each other so he was like yeah i'll 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 take you. I got you. You know, I'll pick you up later. So that worked out. But that also meant I didn't do my vocal warm up in the car on the way to the gig because that's when I do. I didn't even think about it. You know, Russ, I just got in Russ's car. We chit chatted. I get to the gig. I sit down at my drums to play the first song. It's like, oh, interesting. Hmm. Okay, fine. And then, you know, so I'm dealing with my voice and and my drums aren't where I wanted them to be because the screen didn't go up, you know, and until so. If Fling were a band that was used to setting up, you know, before doors open and then coming in and and playing, all of these things would have gone through my head. Right. But we're not. We are a band that goes and sets up and plays. At least that's what we typically do. And uh, and and so that first set was internally, certainly for me, but internally in general was a little bit. Yeah, you know, usually I like to take the first set, especially on a three set night, because we played eight to midnight. I like to take that first set and run it an hour and a half so that I'm not stuck with, you know, a 75 minute third set later in the night when things might start dragging or whatever. You know, Um, I that first set was less than an hour. Uh, Mm. You know, we 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 started maybe we started at eight oh five and nine o'clock came and it was like, yep. Don't need any extra songs. We're done. Like, thanks. We'll see you in 15 minutes, you know, whatever it was. And, uh, and then I got off stage and like we sorted everything out and it was like, OK, let's go. So, yeah, it was just we broke our routine and. Uh, and showed up, everyone showed up later, you know, at like 730 or whatever, and just was like, OK, well, we're all set. We can just roll in and play. And it's like, yeah, we're but as it turns out, we're not all set, you know. Uh, and, and, and so that made things a little interesting. Like I said, it's just, you know, every, it, every band has its own routine with Uptown. We have a completely different routine with, like I said, with monkey fist, different routine, uh, y- y- you know, and you, I think it's important to acknowledge what your band's routine is and at least be very mindful when you break that routine that you like all the automatic things that happen might not be automatic. Like you got to redo your checklist that, you know, Well, that, that's the thing is to me that the, the key is not make the leader crazy. Right. So don't right. make me come find you. Right. Yes. So in general, like I said, we finish sound check. I would say our routine is more like uh, an hour and a half before a gig is usually loaded in. Sure. And an hour and the gig, or let's not say gig an hour before either doors or downbeat is, is sound check. And you know, about a half hour of that and then, or 45 minutes of that. And you know, you've been with us. We're just complicated band yeah. as many wireless units we have and as many people and as many mixes, it just takes a while. So 45 minutes is about right. So we, I, I like us to be done and off stage about a half hour before we play. Okay. Right. And then, you know, sometimes it's a little better. And then I tell the guys 10 minutes before downbeat, be at the side of the stage. Don't make me come looking for you. So, you know, three of the guys go out and smoke and, and you know, some of the guys go to the bar and, and you know, everybody scatters to the wind, but, you know, sure. usually. Sure. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, one thing you don't know is in our band, if, uh, if you miss downbeat for a set or anything like that, 
I'll I'll call Sweet Home Alabama, and if you hear Sweet Home Alabama, your your butt is fined. <laughs> so that's if, awesome. If you are somewhere, if you're somewhere, and you hear the band starting to play Sweet Home Alabama, you should have been on stage, and and uh, there's a problem. That's really funny. That's <laughs> what a so I love this. Like that's that man. That's that. I, yeah, I had no idea about this. That's that, that's so good. Like th- these are the things that I love about bands that have like musical, you know, cues for each other. And that <laughs> like that, like that's freaking great, man. I love that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it happens once in a while. You know, in the history of the house rockers, I had, I had one guy one time. We played a, we played a, a music festival down by the ocean and into town where parking is notoriously horrible, terrible. Sure. And they, they have a big festival, um, you know, tons of art and wine and food booths and that type of stuff. And parking is terrible. And he couldn't find a spot and he eventually just got so, he got so wound up and frustrated. He just went home <sighs> and, uh, and he sent a text message saying, I just couldn't find parking. And I was already late to downbeat by, t- you know, and he was letting me know, looking for parking, looking for parking. Yeah, of course. And then, yeah. you know, we had to start, you know, it was our time. And, and, uh, that was the only time in the history of the band. I had no idea what to do, you know, how, how dramatic a, a action I had to take about that. Right. And I think, I think I benched him for two gigs. I think oh, that's wow. what we did. Oh, wow. Yeah. I yeah. substituted him for two gigs. And- I, you know, I, um, I, I I feel like everybody gets one, like, it, it, one? you know, it, it, everybody gets one and maybe it's one a year, like, it, you know, but there's, there's a, nobody can have a great night every night. It, you know, you need to deliver your best game and you need to be responsible and you need to be professional. At, but we all have lives. We all have stuff going on outside of the band and, and, uh, and for somebody to, I mean, to flake on the entire gig. And I realized he didn't <laughs> flake. Like, you, you know, it wasn't like he was just he sitting, tried. sitting home. Yeah, he tried and then gave up. I, you know, like I, I, I wouldn't do that. I, I, and I say that I wouldn't do that, but I wasn't him in his car. You know, like it's hard. To, it's hard to say. So in like scenarios like that, or, or if somebody, you know, like Dave throws a tantrum at a gig or whatever, um, the guys in fling still laugh about the time that I threw a, a, a tantrum about the cables not being coiled the right way in the bag. Um, but uh, we got <laughs> we got to a gig. Your ADD moment of the. Well, so here's the thing. Um, I'm going to teach you all the right way to coil cables. I, I will do a, a YouTube video or something about this. It, this whole concept of, of, you know, the over under coil cables, like I grok that that keeps the cables in good shape and that's fine. Teaching that to people is very difficult. Getting everyone to do it, even once you've taught it to them is very difficult. It's also an extremely time consuming method. So at the end of the night, what will happen if you choose to use that method, it will be a disaster. You'll either take a long time to get them all exactly right. And then you got to find when you do it that way, you know, you got to have cable ties so that you can hold them together and they just need to be just so. And if any part of that process falls apart, you wind up with rat's nest of cables in the box or the bag or whatever it is you put your cables in. I don't like rat's nest. So 20 years ago, I changed. Uh, and I will tell you how I coil, coil tables. But the first thing I will tell you is that the very first cable that I started coiling this way is one that I still use at every gig. Cables do not get destroyed this way. And it's going to sound crazy, but I coil cables the same way you would fold sheets. I take the two ends of an XLR cable. I put them next to each other and I find the middle. And then I take the middle and I bring it up to those two ends and I find the middle again. You know, I find the end again and I just I keep folding it up on itself until I have maybe a two to three foot length left. And then I tie it in a big loose knot and I throw it in the bag. And the beauty of that method is everything in the bag stays by itself. You can put as many cables in a bag or a box. Doesn't matter. You don't need cable ties. The cables are long enough that by the time you're tying them, you're not actually putting any kinks in them or anything. And they do really well. And then you can just dump the cables out at the gig and everything is there. Nothing's tied in a knot. Everything's independent. It's all good to go. It's freaking brilliant. And the person who taught it to me is a genius. And it sounds like I learned it in Austin, Texas, but 
your guitar player, Simon, also coils cables the proper way because he learned it. <laughs> he learned it the right way, too. So um, so we got to a fling gig and uh, it was one of these where we had a really tight window to set up. Uh, it was one of those Hampton Beach gigs. So you can't get in there early because they the place where the stage is is used by diners and they make their money on food. So you are not the priority until you have to be, you know. So we're getting ready about to set up. I go to get cables out of the bag. And for whatever reason, at the last gig, the cables had just gotten shoved in the bag. They, they, they weren't even coiled, let alone tied. They were just shoved in the bag. And, uh, and that, and it was like, you know, I start pulling them out and I trying to like untie them. It's like, what is going on? And for whatever reason, I was like, that's it. I dumped every, I dumped the whole mess out. And I sat one by one. I extracted each cable. I recoiled it. I retied it. And I put them all in the bag. And it took like 20 minutes. And then I said, all right, now you can set up. And uh, and the guys just let me do, let me go. Because they were like, all right, well, we've never seen Dave do this before. But uh, I, I think the best thing is to just, this is just going to happen. And uh, so they were patient with me. And I appreciated that. Um, everybody gets one. You know, it's just how it goes, I think. Everybody gets one. I think it's a good idea. You know, I mean, if it, if you, I have one guy in my band who's always last on stage. Always the same guy. Yep. Always waits to. I I don't know if he's that way in everything in his life. I would imagine he is. One guy (laughs) is always last. Yeah. 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 And it's it's been for so long the same thing that it's now kind of a a running meme in our band. You know. Sure. Everybody on stage, count one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Where's where's so and so? Yep. Everybody smiles. Everybody smiles. He makes it. good. Sure. 99 times out of 100. Yeah. 99 times out of 100, he makes it. One that's time good. out of 100, he gets Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> well, you know, that's what it's there for, right? You know, it's fine. <laughs> that's right. That's And you know what? That's not a, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a terrible song to open with. If people want to dance, that song will bring them <laughs> to the dance floor. So, you know, maybe he's doing you a favor. Maybe he's realizing, you know, these people need a little extra juice tonight. I'm going to take one for the team. I'm going to let Very them come funny. up. Yeah, that's right. We actually had a big corporate kick the other uh, night where uh, one of my more reliable guys got caught in a bathroom line and the uh, person running the event was insistent. We started right you know, at seven o'clock and, um, and he wasn't there. He got there about seven Oh three and he was, he was sheet white. Like I gave him the, the stink eye as he was, as he was approaching. And then he had a, you know, great show. I mean, he just tore the house down. And afterwards I was like, what the heck? He goes, I got stuck in the bathroom line. I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't get in and it couldn't get out. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, you're lucky you had a good show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, some, but sometimes, I mean, there is that thing where whatever it is, you know, if it's that you're concerned because you don't know the songs or something happens, but if you walk on stage a little bit anxious, like manageably anxious for whatever reason, that, Turns out to be a good show, you know, that uh, I've, mm. I've, I found that for me and I find it for most people, you know, you, cause you're, you're alert, you're aware, you're, you know, your adrenaline's pumping a little bit, you know, you don't have to wait for the crowd to give that to you. You're ready to go. And that, that I only get thing. anxious when, when there's, um, two things, a lot of family mm. or, or, uh, old friends, like high school friends or something like that. I haven't seen in a long time. A general gig, no matter how big it is, I don't really feel any sure any different than a club date or anything. Like that. I'm pretty much just trying to find my zone. But the the times that I'm keenly aware is when there's faces that or people that I haven't seen in a long, long time, or people who haven't seen me since I started doing the band again. That which would be a long time. Sure, those those, those moments get me out of my zone and you know more into my head. Yeah. So that to me, that's that's a different kind of anxiety. Right. The the, that's the I'm concerned about, you know, what people are going to think, even though, you Mm. know, you can deliver a good show. Like, right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's not really a concern. You go play for thousands of people and that's fine. It's those four people that I have an issue with, you know. Um, Right. Right. I mean, it's that and that if you get into your head. Yeah, that's bad kind of anxiety. I'm, I'm talking about the the kind where you're just a little on alert is is mm. more the thing like oh wait a minute like something's not right or something's not normal and i need i can control it though and so i need to be on alert to make sure everything settles in okay like you know new song or 
uh, y- you know, weird setup or you know, whatever it is. But yeah, that anxiety about I know somebody in the crowd and I hope that they don't think this is ridiculous. That kind of thing sucks. <laughs> I, I, it doesn't yes. happen often to me, but I, I, I am certainly no stranger to it. I, you know, it's like I, it, there's one madhouse recently. I walked out and somebody was there and it was like, Oh, I don't know that they're going to like this, you know, cause madhouse is a weird thing, you know? And that, that was the most recent time I experienced it. And I, I had to like, thankfully madhouse also requires a lot of attention for me, you know? So once we got going, I forgot about that person because I had many, many other things to concern myself with, but uh, sure. you know, but yeah, walking out, I saw him and it was like, Oh, I did not want to see that. Like that's I, no, 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 no. <laughs> forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. But they liked it. So it was fine. You know, so it was good in the end, but <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that it takes you uh, 45 minutes to do. Is that line checks or sound check or 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 what? Well, so this is from everybody on stage with their mics on, yeah. you know, ready to kind of walk through it. It takes us about 45 minutes to, to do a sound check. So I think that's why. Oh, go ahead. That's you may- those, yeah, that's why those festival gigs are, are miserable for us, because right. a lot of times they're a half hour changeover and it just. It, and not that's not only a half hour changeover, but it's a half hour of moving monitors around to our stage plot and all that type of stuff. Sure. Yeah. So we well, don't that, do too many of those. That's where I think about what like Dan Meblin was talking about, where he has his mixer that he brings with them and they mix the stage with all the time. It doesn't matter where they are. Somebody else can take tails out of it. Right. You know, that that whole thing would save that, at least in terms of monitor mixes. Right. Because everybody's monitor mix is exactly the same as it was at the last gig, you know, and then you're done. Uh, of course, they're all on in-ears too. So there's, right. a, there's a path to get there, uh, which is a difficult one. I'm, I floated the idea to the Fling guys about, you know, going with all in-ears the other day. And um, it did not, it, 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 you know, it's a long row to hoe, I think, getting people there. It's impossible, I think, to get someone on in-ears if they don't want it for themselves because it's a tough transition Mm -hmm. as you well know it really is yeah it so if you don't and even me i mean i'm i'm the world's biggest advocate of them i was the world's biggest advocate even before i shifted to them and it still took me a year to really get to the point where it was like okay i can function this way and then it's still a struggle like i was really pleased with myself on saturday night i did the entire gig with both ears in the whole way through uh, That's great. Which really was great. But I, you know, I had exactly the mix that I wanted. I, with fling, I can run a stereo in-ear mix so I can keep the volume low, but I can hear everything. Cause it's, I've got a nice field to kind of spread things with it. The stereo mix makes a huge difference, man. And- so, so let's try this again. We've done this many times over the past couple of years, but let's try this again. So, okay. you know, for me, I struggle with it. I, I, and to me, my my basic that I can live with is just give me enough of my vocals so I don't have to you know push myself mm-hmm. and and I'll take one of them out so I can feel the band or hear the band and that is that is a yeah I get it I totally get it but that's how I survive many uh, gigs understood and actually it's no I get it Surviving. bad for my ear good for my voice how's that because yes you know you know how loud our band is yes. and you know I'm I try not to be part of the problem for that. And so, you know, me turning monitors up as loud as I can to get my voice comfortably over the, you know, the, the din of the stage volume. Yeah. I just feel guilty doing that. Right. So, uh, you know, I just don't want to do that. So, so to me here, here are some of the things that happen. One is that the sends on the trans on the transmitter units for in-ears are set correctly. Cause I'm amazed often how I just can't get enough of me or, or once my, my pack starts acting unpredictably, I can't think about that in the middle of a gig. Right. Sure. So it's just, it either, it goes to some level of, of useless to me. It's just weird where, you know, I have it where I kind of want it at, um, at sound check. And then as things get louder in the world, and I go to reach to turn it up there. I'm not getting much more of me. So I don't know whether there's a limiter in place or whether it's literally the send on the transmitter is not set correctly. Uh, you're probably it could be both, but there's almost certainly a limiter in place. Uh, all of those units. I don't Which one do you use for your belt pack transmitter thing? Sure. 
It's the sure one sure. that that definitely has a limiter. And and yeah, I used to use I don't use a wireless um, unit because I don't have to. I don't go anywhere. Right. So it's just one less battery to to fight with. Uh, you don't come out from the from the kit and sing a song every now and then. Uh, occasionally I will, but I'll I won't use ears for that. It's fine. You know, it's it, it doesn't if it were happening every gig. Yes, but it doesn't happen every gig. So it's fine. Uh, but when I used a belt pack, it was a sure it was I mean, it was a while ago, but it was a higher end one back then. It was I think it was a PSM 700 or something, but mm-hmm. uh, which doesn't exist anymore uh, unless you have one. And then they do um, with, like me. <laughs> But um, it, the I did find that the limiter on that had kind of a weird feel to it. Like once you got close to that, everything really mm-hmm. started to just like mush together. So I, I did find that with that and this maybe this is what you're experiencing. If if I could live with two ears in for the whole gig, I was fine. Like I never had that problem. But, you know, the problem is when you take one out, you sort of naturally want to turn the other one up. And Mm -hmm. and then you're probably hitting that limit. So, yeah, that might be part of it that the other part I will say is and, you know, you're the leader of the band. You own at least most of the gear. See if uh, Bill can cut an extra channel out for you so you can run in stereo ears. It makes a huge difference, even if it's tried stereo one night and it just was uh, it was it takes a little clarity. Yeah. Yeah. So. He tried, and I guess we could probably go back. We have the channels now because we bought the thirty-two channel board, but right. but um, we got the bigger board. But um, yeah, again, and also, so Eve, stereo, and, and let I, me let me I, I I just just for anybody listening, if you're doing stereo, here's what I find. Um, I would almost say leave almost nothing down the middle. I for my mix, I find that I leave kick, snare and bass run straight down the middle because those are the things that, that I, that I can deal with in the middle. And I, but this is a learned thing, right? And snare, I just have a, enough of a touch so that I don't wind up playing too loud. Right. I want to be able to hear, and it's either snare or overhead. I don't need both, you know, but I need something to sort of bleed in uh, at least some of that snare drum so that I'm not playing too loud. And then from there I take, even if it's only one guitar, I would, I would pan it, not very much, you know, like, like, you know, if it's, if it's 10 zero, and two, what's that? 10 and two. No, that's way too much. It would be, wow. uh, yeah. On a clock, it would be more like, uh, you know, nine, you know, 55 minutes and five minutes like mm. that. Yeah. It's it, it. And that, but at least in terms of what the, the, the boards that I use and all of that stuff, that very slight differential is all I need. And it really does spread it out really, really well, too hard of a pan. And it starts feeling very disconnected and disjointed. So it's, it's just this very, very slight thing. And, uh, you know, Aaron plays two keyboards. And so I split his two keys. And the beauty of that is I can cut the, their volume level down by, you know, probably six decibels each because I don't have to, I, I, you know, I can hear the difference between them. And I do the same with the guitars, you know, whatever, you know, just a hair off uh, of each other. And then the same with vocals. I take my vocal and that goes left a little bit and everybody else's vocal goes right a little bit. And this wide field really makes a huge difference. Um, it, it really like I, I, I played a couple of, well, when we do uptown gigs, I haven't quite convinced them to cut me an extra channel yet, but there is one. So I'm thinking I, I just need to buddy up with, uh, with Dave, our sound guy and, and see if he'll do it for me. But, um, it, you know, so with uptown, I run, mo- I run mono in ears. And then, you know, I came and did these fling gigs recently and I was like, Oh, right. Stereo. Yes. This makes all the difference in the world. So mm. yeah, I got to try it again. It is a constant battle. I mean, yeah. it's a constant journey, right? Right. It is. And a when journey. it's right. Yeah. Well, but the funny, the hard part about the journey is that it's like one step up and two steps back all the time because the variables change room to room, the gig to gig, you know, it, well, it's just so that's the thing, though, is levels like at with fling. I can start the gig and I know that I am 95 percent at where I need to be. And I haven't touched anything since the last gig mm. because Sounds I get like every a dream to me. Yeah, well, it is. That's that's exactly it. But I I know like on our mixer, I know, OK, 
guitar, I, you know, if I'm getting a guitar level, I want it to peak at, you know, on our mixer, it says zero. It's not really zero because it's a digital mixer. And so there's some headroom or whatever built in. But, you know, on that mixer, I want the guitar to to peak at, at like zero or, or maybe plus one or whatever. And so we set the gain and and I know of a baseline where to start. But as we're as we're line checking everything, it's like, OK, great. And keys, I do the same thing with and everything. Right. You know, we get them all to where they where they should be. And then my ears are there's nothing else to change. The level that I had at the last gig is exactly what I want, because 100 percent of what I'm hearing is coming through my ears. It's great. But, but it you know, it like I had to work really hard to get the system get that to base the, level to get the system to where I can do that very quickly. Yeah, exactly. Where it's sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right. It's an ongoing journey. And I mean, here we are, you know, I've been doing this. I think I started with in ears 17, 18 years ago. And I mean, we're still like, you know, it's still something that I'm like refining. It, it's it, the refinements are getting, you know, smaller and smaller, but still, you know, it's like, and, and then like, I said going to Uptown, well, I got to I I know what I want, but it's, you know, it's a new board, it's a new band. Like with Fling, I, you know, I've been doing it for 12 years with Fling, so I know exactly what I want with Fling. With Uptown, it's like, "Oh, no, no, no. You know what? I do need a little more guitar. I can't be like those guys in Rush that have different in-ear mixes for every section of every song." I was watching right. that movie about those guys, you know, it was like there was a behind the scenes movie or whatever. Your friend Brad was in it and um, they were talking about the guy that runs the monitors and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, here's Limelight or whatever. And and so at the beginning of the song, you know, there's this section where Neil needs to hear lots more guitar because he, you know, that's what sets the tempo of the tune and he's got to come in right. And then as soon as the band comes in, we switch to section B, which lowers the guitar in his ears and just gives him this. It's like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> that's complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. Yes. Yeah, so and risky. Have, <laughs> well, right. Well, and completely unrealistic if you don't have someone dedicated to mixing monitors for you. Right. Like this sure. is this is a and they put on a show. Right. So everybody knows the set list. It's basically I mean, they they on the last tour or whatever, they they mixed up three different set lists. But it's like, OK, tonight we're playing list C. This is it. And the guy can just load the patch for or the program for list C. And it's like, great, this is all I need to do. When we get to this point in the song, I hit the space bar. It changes everybody's mix to whatever it needs to be like that whole deal. Which is pretty, you know, but that's that's a completely different scenario. <laughs> yeah, but it sure would be nice. Yeah. And and, sure and then nice. that guy, that monitor engineer can put in, you know, can listen to each person's thing and be like, oh, wait, I know that he wants a little more vocal here. Like, you know, you, you get to learn each other. So, yeah. Anyway, those things gets crazy. Dream. That's the hey, dream. you sent me um, some interesting stuff. You sent me um, some information about that dongle wireless um, guitar transmitter system. I, yeah, I saw a thing on Facebook from a company called Amposo, where it, it is. It's exactly what you just said. It's it's two dongles. One, and by dongle, this is a term we tech guys use, right, for the things that plug into our computers. But this really is like just a, a dongle that's, you know, maybe twice as long as, as the quarter inch plug. And one part stays in and one part stays out of your guitar. And that's it. That's your transmitter. Presumably it's got some kind of battery in it or whatever. And then there's another one that's the same size that you plug into your amp and there's your wireless for your, for your rig. Have you ever used So it? I just yeah. want to talk about this a little bit yeah. because it's kind of cool. And it's something that I've been wondering why it hasn't happened sooner. So wireless technology, you know, all wireless technology, but you know, specifically for guitar players, you know, we, we buy something, you know, it used to be that it was a rack mounted unit and then they shrunk down to kind of pedal guitar pedal effect pedal sure. yep. size units you could put on your pedal board, <clears throat> which is cool. But it, you know, the miniature miniaturization of most things electronics you would think would have taken place here a little bit sooner. I think one company might have um, a patent on this because I've seen this dongle technology in four or five different, like Carvin sells one. Uh, and I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, I'm not, don't quote me on this, but I wonder if it's the same thing with different people's names on it, which is, which would be interesting. I think the Carvin one, and I'm not seeing anything on this, on this um, Amposa one, they're um, uh, 
they're rechargeable. The units themselves are rechargeable. You actually put the units into a little sure. charging case, and so which is kind of cool too. So no batteries, right? Right. That makes and they look sense. a little small for batteries. These things look kind of small for any well, kind of yeah, any kind of watch removable battery. battery. Yeah. They, no, they've got to just have a battery in them somehow. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. But yeah, I, you know, you have to hear them. I, and it took me, right. I went through a couple of different guitar wirelesses. I use a line six unit here. I've had a couple of them and I really liked them. I had Shure's and they were challenging for me. I really heard that co- compounding effect of it. It really kind of squished my sound totally. and changed my sound in a way I didn't like. Uh, I think Shure's probably the industry standard. So, you know, there, maybe there's a way around that, that sound or maybe people just deal with it. But I've been really a fan of the line six. I also had a Sony unit for a while that I really liked. Um, but none of them are perfect. Um, but the, it, I, my thought on these wireless things, it's interesting to me. I would think that a company like this should go to Gibson and say, build this into your guitar. If there's two things that you almost want in every guitar, every guitar player needs is simple wireless would, you know, that'd be a little bit more advanced, but, but also a tuner. You wonder why, what we have these dongle tuners that are hanging off headstocks and look kind of weird and, yeah. and are loose and floating around. You'd think that these are two things that would be made to build options for a lot of guitars. I get the art of Luthery and you know, that that sure. needs to be taken into, into consideration, but it seems pretty fundamental. I would love to have no dongle uh, and have a way to, you know, like they're doing it with some things with um, uh, some of the amps now are, are Bluetooth amps, right? Yeah. And you get you can, you can actually communicate via Bluetooth with a dongle. Yeah, you know, from your guitar. But Bluetooth is weird. There's a there's a no, no I, I, it's not the right technology there. for the it's solution. The right but tech, the point but being. Yes. Fair. Fair. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I would think somebody should go to Fender, go to Gibson, go to Eastman, go to, you know, go to manufacturing and say, hey, have a build to order option where the wireless is built into the guitar and the other end, you know, can be just this dongle that you attach to your your pedal board or direct into your amp, whatever your choice is, and away you go. And it's one less, you know, thing to, to plug in. It's truly more freedom. Well, that's it seems true. Like that if be- you put it, I can, I have to imagine, and obviously we haven't used any of these things that we've mentioned here, but like this Amposo thing, the, the dongles, right? The carbon or the Amposo. I, 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 my guess is that the battery is going to deliver. I'm looking on their website to see eight hours of playtime. Okay. So that's one gig. Like I wouldn't trust that for two gigs, right? But that's fine. That gets you through one gig. If you put this into your guitar and you could do a much bigger battery. And if you're putting it down on yeah. your pedal board or back by your amp, well, you've got power now, right? Because you're not running your pedal board on batteries anymore. You know, chances are hopefully not. And, you know, so you can just plug in and, and now you really don't have to worry about it from a, you know, gig to gig standpoint. So, Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, that's my thought. It looks cool, and I think all this stuff is getting smaller and lighter. You know, yeah. like if you look at you look at the tuner technology they're selling. Now the headstock tuners are getting really, really small. Again, I think that's I don't know why that wouldn't be built into most guitars, especially guitars that already have electronics in them. Yep. But um, acoustic guitars that already have electronics in them. But but and they are built into many, many, many. But um, this is a basic functionality you need for your guitar. Yeah. To know if it's in tune, so <laughs> yeah. you know, make it easier. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. Yep. This Imposo thing, I mean, it's like 70 bucks, too. So clearly, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, we haven't tested it, so it might it might sound great. It might not, you know, but um, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was thinking of you this morning, my friend. Last week we were talking about uh, guitars going out of tune at gigs and I was doing some work mm-hmm. and just had f- some fish tunes running in the background and they started this one song and uh, man. A bootleg? Tra- no, um, uh, technically, no, actually, this was a, a live recording, but it was from their live fish volume 10. And I only noticed right. that because I was surprised they picked it because this tune sample in a jar, it starts with a, a guitar intro and it's all these chords and Trey's guitar. I think it was his G string. If I, if I was hearing it correctly, it was just like so far out of tune that it was, I mean, it was just bad, you know, but I think, and I, again, I'm, I, I was only hearing like one song chopped out of a gig. Cause that's how these little compilations are. I think it was segued out of another tune. And so I think in the moment he probably made the decision. All right, look, the energy's up. I was, I segued into this to keep energy going. I'm just going to deal with this, you know? Uh, 
And uh, and so he started the tune and you could hear throughout the tune. There were moments where, you know, he he retuned a little bit and a little bit. And there's a solo at the end. And by the time he got to the end, either he just didn't play that string for the solo or had had resolved it enough that like bending could get it, you know, in tune enough to to get out of it. But <laughs> um, but it was like, oh, so he yeah. was literally planning his solo. To either avoid the out of tune string or to bend the string into tune. Probably. Uh, it wouldn't that's surprise pretty, that's me. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, that guy, I mean, he's, he's crazy, right? I mean, he thinks about this stuff. He's got big so, ears. So, but yeah, it was well, just interesting hearing. I don't know if you like, know. There you go. Okay. So my bass player is a ridiculously fantastic musician. He is, does not have the physique or the the physical makeup of most bass players, he's got these short, stubby, fat fingers. Not yeah. long, you know, he, he's just a freak of nature, right? He breaks more bass strings than any bass player I've ever even heard of in my life. I I've mean, never heard of bass players say, breaking strings. So there at you all. go. Right. He breaks many strings. And he breaks so many strings. And he's so dang smart. He will not take a song off he'll play around the broken string. So imagine playing. He probably likes the challenge. Well, that, that would be Steve. But um, <laughs> Imagine playing, imagine playing, you know, a tower of power song and some of those crazy funky bass lines, And he works around the broken string, man. I mean, yeah, it's, it's one of the, it's, it's like reality TV type stuff. That's crazy, man. That's awesome. I yep. love that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yep. Well, that's uh, I think I, I can't top that. I don't want to top that. So I think that's a good place to end the show. Don't you think? Yeah. All uh, hail Steve. All hail Steve. Yeah. No, he's a great bass player. I, I, I love playing with that guy. He he and I think he and I both think in 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 eighth notes and 16th notes. Like I, I always say he that, said the same thing. Well, that's very kind of him, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um you know, I, I find that guys either think in quarters and eighths or they think in eighths and sixteenths and um, and it's great if your rhythm section is in sync on that, whichever way it goes. It doesn't like I, I have my preference because of who I am, but like as long as your band ha like has that in sync, you're in you're in better shape than you would be if you didn't. So, yeah, 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 it's good. I like the way that guy thinks and I like the way he plays, obviously. So, yeah. All right. Anything else, man? Or are we uh, calling it a day here? No, we did good. So uh, you had a good gig last week. I had a good gig last week. I have five in a row coming up, three house rocker gigs and then two acoustic gigs. Wow. So it's that time of year where these things just kind of line up and, yeah. you know, you know, you want to, it's a fun thing, leaving it all out on the stage, but knowing you better, you got to be conscious of your voice because you got to go a couple more days is, is, you know, a little bit of a management trick. Yep. So this is my first five in a row in probably three or four months. Yeah. Take care of yourself, man. That's uh thank you. Yeah. That's it. You're right. It, it's that, that trick of, well, it's hydration, right? That's the, that's the key to that. I, that for me, anyway. it's hydration, but it's not screaming. It's, it's, control, it's staying right? in control. Yes. I mean, that, that to me is ultimately what it is. Singing properly, singing from your diaphragm, breathing, breathing, yep. breathing. That's the key. I mean, you, yep. you can sing rock and roll every night. If you're not screaming, once you scream, you start to damage stuff and swell stuff. And that's when you get messed up. I, I, I will put an asterisk on that. As long as you're not screaming incorrectly, because there's guys like Dave Grohl and Sammy Hagar. And I mean, countless others who are what I would call rock and roll screamers but that's a very different kind of screaming than you know just like letting it all go that's a very controlled mm. learned thing you, you know and and those guys can do it every night without any trouble so that's yeah. true i don't know how that happens but uh, i don't either i don't either yeah but it's how it goes all right all right now we're out of here right finally i don't know all adios right. adios we'll see you uh well i guess we'll see you next week because that's how it goes that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Hey, man, when you're doing I'll your gigs this weekend. I'll always be performing. Yeah, that's right. Tell me what. Yeah, no. Say. That's, I always be performing. You have to be. I know. That's how it goes. <laughs>